Okay, so hello everyone. Good morning and thanks for coming to the new session of uh, our Gravity CISI FPU Gravity webinars. Uh, today we are very happy to have with us uh, Shaheen Sheikh Jabari from the Institute for uh, sorry, I have here my notes. <laughs> Institute for Research in Fundamental Science uh, in Tehran. Uh, Shaheen did his PhD in the in the Sharif University of Technology in Tehran. Uh, and then he's been in different places like the University of Helsinki, Hels Helsinki, sorry, uh, Stanford University, and also in ICTP here in Trieste. And now, well, he's uh, back in Tehran, uh, in the, as I said, in the Institute, uh, in the Institute for Research in Fundamental Science. And well, he's a uh, recognized expert in many different topics, including string theory and non-commutative geometry. And today he's going to talk about his research on temperature of Hordensky black holes. So please, if you have any questions, just leave them for the end of the talk. Uh, you can just ask them later, or if your mic is not working or you're just shy, you can write them in the chat and I will ask them myself. Okay, so Shaheen. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the time uh, given to me for presenting this uh, work. And uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so th this is a work we did a uh, few months ago uh, in collaboration with uh, Kamal Hajian, Mohamed Raifiya, and Stefan, uh, who is, I think, all, uh, uh, they are all in the audience. Uh, so basically, uh, as the uh, title suggests, this is about uh, thermodynamics of certain black holes in uh, Horndesky theory. So uh, I'll basically uh, start with. Uh, uh, mentioning some words about uh, each and every term that uh, comes into the title. Uh, I'll very briefly review uh, some facts about black hole thermodynamics. And in particular, I'll focus on the <clears throat> entropy of black holes, which is in general given by the so-called Wald entropy. And uh, I'll just uh, focus on uh, some features of the Wald entropy and in particular the ambiguities which are uh, there in using the Wald formula. And uh, basically I argue that for a class of black holes that we are interested in, uh, this Wald entropy formula does not work as it is usually stated. Uh, there is another uh, formulation uh, which is uh, solution phase space method and this uh, basically helps us to uh, remove the ambiguity which is of concern for us in the world entropy and uh, then uh, using this formulation we basically uh, in check, in check and uh, that uh, the end uh, basically to have the first law of uh, thermodynamics for this class of uh, black holes in the horn series which i'll introduce of course uh, we need to redefine black hole temperature. And uh, I'll give you the formula that we have proposed for the uh, black hole temperature and of course the uh, basic checks that it uh, makes the first law uh, work in the uh, proper way. And I'll uh, just uh, finish with some summary and output. So uh, just some uh, facts and about black holes. As you all know, uh, black holes consist a general class of uh, solutions to theories of uh, gravity uh, in general. Uh, and they are characterized by their horizons. And uh, it, for me, uh, and for most practical purposes, uh, horizon is a boundary of outgoing causal curves uh, uh, in the region which we call the outside horizon. Basically, horizon is a, uh, typically a null surface which divides space-time into uh, two uh, causally disconnected regions. Uh, it's generically smooth and non-singular uh, and is a null surface. Uh, moreover, black holes are, uh, could be viewed as some localized sources for some char conserved charges like mass, angular, momentum, electric, and magnetic charge. Uh, one can uh, basically uh, study uh, dynamics of black holes, as has been famously done in this paper by Barney Carter and Hawking, in, uh, and check that uh, 
Black holes obey four laws which closely resemble laws of thermodynamics. And uh, just as a historical remark, uh, in this paper, actually, there's a, a famous footnote that they say this is just a resemblance and it's not thermodynamics. But then uh, around the same time in seven, 1972, uh, Bekenstein uh, uh, studying thermodynamics in presence of horizons uh, and black holes uh, concluded that uh, black hole uh, should be, uh, should have some entropy if you want to save se second law of thermodynamics. And uh, then uh, for, for um, black holes, which are solutions to uh, Einstein general relativity, uh, we have the Bekenstein uh, Hawking formula for the entropy, which uh, says uh, uh, the entropy is proportional to the horizon area. Uh, in a parallel line of developments around the same time, um, Hawking uh, studied uh, quantum fields around uh, black hole horizon, uh, ignoring the back reaction effects and so on. And uh, the, the result was uh, the Hawking radiation, uh, namely black holes, uh, at least stationary black holes, uh, have, um, emit some a perfect black body radiation with a given temperature, like any thermodynamic system. And uh, just combining all these facts, uh, this resemblance which was revealed in this uh, paper should actually be viewed as uh, more than resemblance, it, uh, stating that the black holes are actually thermodynamic system like any other thermodynamical system. And uh, for stationary black holes with a killing horizon, the Hawking temperature is the surface gravity divided by 2 pi. So that surface gravity is the gravity uh, or the acceleration seen by any observer who's uh, sitting at the horizon. And this very uh, relation is what we are going to explore in, uh, more closely in this uh, talk. Uh, so the combining Bekenstein's and Hawking's results we have for the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, which is an exact proportional constant, which is one over four, and the temperature associated with the black hole is kappa over two pi. And uh, again, one as a further historical remark, uh, in 1976, Arnold uh, showed that, as implied by Einstein's uh, equivalence principle. Um, uh, this temperature is not only associated with uh, uh, black holes uh, and uh, the killing horizons, uh, but uh, is more general to any killing horizon, regardless of whether we have a black hole or not. Uh, namely, if you are an accelerated observer, a linear observer, this kappa is at, uh, basically replaced with the, uh, the acceleration. And again, we have the same uh, temperature. This is basically uh, required if we are going to have Einstein's equivalence principle. Uh, but for black holes with bifurcated killing horizon, uh, Walt showed that the black hole entropy, this uh, relation uh, for uh, Einstein's gravity, uh, is a conserved charge. Uh, it's a conserved charge associated with the killing vector which generates the horizon. And uh, it, also, in the same work, Walt proposed an, uh, a formula, which I'll review in the next slide, which replaces this area law for a generic theory of gravity, which is the geomorphism invariant. However, Walt's uh, derivation relies on the fact that black hole temperature is given by kappa over 2 pi. So, uh, and uh, in a Follow up paper, Iyer and Walt showed that the laws of uh, the first law of thermodynamics uh, could be derived in uh, very gen general terms uh, for any uh, diffeomorphism invariant theory uh, with the entropy uh, given by the uh, Walt formula. So, uh, if you denote the, uh, the black hole charges, namely mass, uh, angular momentum, and electric charge. Uh, by M and J and Q. Mm, the first law of black hole thermodynamics is uh, basically given in this form. Uh, there are some chemical potentials like omega H and phi H, which are the horizon angular velocity and the horizon electric potential. Uh, this uh, 
chemical potentials or properties which are attributed to the horizon and uh, they are generically uh, observer dependent quantities and, uh, and they, they depend on the geometry I mean on the black hole solution but they do not depend on the theory uh, of gravity where we, the solution and the black hole is a solution to on the other hand, these charges, uh, M, S, J, and Q, uh, both depend both on the solution and the theory. And among these charges, entropy is uh, special in the sense that it's dimensionless and is observer independent. So the only observer independent quantity in this game is uh, black hole entropy. That's good. Uh, let's now come back to the world entropy. Uh, Wald entropy was derived and works only for bifurcated killing horizons. So if you have, for example, a, a real black hole uh, in space time, uh, which, for example, in, uh, 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 is accreting mass, it, it doesn't have a, a killing horizon. So the, the Wald formula does not work for that in a precise sense. Uh, it's a uh, noether charge, or more precisely, noether wall conserved charge associated with the zeta h, the, which generates the killing horizon. And uh, as I mentioned, it, it, it depends on this solution and the theory, but in the theory, uh, in, uh, where if, if we define the theory by an action, we usually have uh, the gravity part of the action plus the matter part. And the wall formula only depends on the gravity part of the action. And as an input, it use, uh, uses surface gravity equals temperature. So let me just uh, go through briefly the derivation that wall had. So let's uh, suppose that we have an action uh, which is generally covariant. And in, I'm using wall's formulation where this L is a top form, is a D form in D dimensions. Uh, and in, it's a function of metric and uh, covariant derivative and all the other fields are uh, denoted by this phi. And uh, we assume that this uh, theory admits a black hole solution, which has a pi for hitting horizon generated by zeta h. And uh, surface gravity by definition is uh, related to uh, derivative of this zeta h in this way, where this epsilon is uh, the binormal to two form to the co-dimension to um, as the bifurcation surface, which will be noted by h. So in the Schwarzschild case, this h is just the uh, two sphere, which is sitting at t and r uh, equals constant surfaces. So that's, uh, the, but in general d dimensions, this is a co-dimension to surface. And uh, we are fixing the normalization of this binormal in this way. And another wald uh, conserved charge or the wald entropy is defined through this equation, which is given uh, entropy is two pi times the integral over this h of uh, a, mm, d minus two form uh, through wald, which is defined according to wald in this way. So it's uh, given by the derivative of the <coughs> Lagrangian with respect to uh, Riemann curvature. And this is why I, uh, basically the wall entropy only knows about the gravitation part of the action, which by definition is the parts in the action which con contributes to uh, variation of the Lagrangian with respect to Riemann. Okay, uh, remember this uh, equation, uh, we'll uh, come back to it later. But then, as you are all familiar with the Noether theorem, uh, when we use Noether theorem, there are always ambiguities uh, in the conserved charge. And uh, to be very precise, there are uh, one can distinguish three uh, sort of terms which uh, contribute to this ambiguity, uh, which I have denoted by W, Z, and Y ambiguities. Uh, and they have this form, that W ambiguity is uh, made out of these other functions, uh, fields that we have computed over the solution, of course, times zeta H. Uh, this Z is such that D of Z appears in Q. And as you can see, uh, if this H is uh, compact, it doesn't contribute to this uh, entropy. And then we have the Y ambiguity. 
any such that it's uh, a function of other fields and the variation of the other fields along the second edge. So this is <clears throat> basically the most general form of ambiguities that one can have. And the W ambiguity, it comes from the, if you just go through uh, Noether theorem, uh, it comes from the ambiguity in the uh, definition of Lagrangian up to a total derivative. If you shift the Lagrangian this way, uh, you'll pick up uh, W ambiguity in the Noether charge. But uh, of course, in order to uh, basically declare that this uh, entropy is a physical charge, these ambiguities must be absent. Uh, so ambiguous conserved charge doesn't make any sense physically. And Wald actually uh, did this very carefully, as he usually does in his papers. And uh, uh, first, uh, he noted that uh, if zeta h is a killing vector, the variation of any field uh, over the solution along the killing vector must be zero. Uh, this is just the definition of being a killing vector and uh, or the symmetry of the solution and at uh, the bifurcate surface by definition if it is a uh, non-degenerate uh, surface zeta h vanishes at this co-dimension two surface so this using these facts and just going back to this zeta h vanishes uh, at the bifurcation surface so it doesn't contribute <coughs> here <coughs> uh, this is zero because zeta h is uh, killing and this one did not contribute to the charge in the first place so these ambiguities regardless of the form Wald argued uh, that do not contribute to uh, the entropy uh, but of course there was a, an implicit assumption uh, and that for example this data edge could be vanishing as you approach uh, the horizon but uh, you can uh, in principle, construct Ws which are blowing up such that this combination W times zeta H remains finite, and hence this may remain. However, Wald argued that uh, for having a smooth horizon, one cannot construct such Ws at the, uh, which uh, basically blow up at the horizon. And uh, based on this uh, smoothness argument, uh, Wald uh, basically dropped all these uh, ambiguities, and hence we uh, arrived at uh, an ambiguity-free equ um, equation which gives the entropy. But uh, as we'll see, actually, smoothness of the horizon uh, does not uh, really uh, imply that the W should be zero. Uh, it uh, implies a much weaker condition, and hence this brings back the possibility of having this ambiguity in, in the game in general. Uh, but as people have shown in almost all the examples of black holes that uh, people have considered prior to our work, uh, this W ambiguity was vanishing as Wald argued, but uh, uh, the smoothness uh, condition is not strong enough to do so. So it, uh, there could be examples which uh, uh, are ambiguous due to this W. And this is actually what we'll show is uh, what's happening in the Horndesky family of black holes. Uh, it's not limited to the Horndesky. It can be, uh, one can actually find many more examples uh, with this property that the W ambiguity does not vanish at the bifurcate killing points. Okay. So uh, there's a, a parallel uh, formulation for computing the entropy uh, and other charges for the black hole. And that's uh, called solution phase space method that I'll just briefly review. Uh, the important feature of this solution phase space uh, compared to the previous one, uh, the Noether, uh, Wald Noether charge, uh, is that it's free of this W ambiguity. So uh, if we can basically be, uh, base our computations on this method, uh, we don't deal with uh, uh, this, we don't see this ambiguity, and uh, so we can basically bypass this problem that I just mentioned. Uh, but this formulation has other uh, features, which I'll come to shortly, and that's uh, we need to check the integrability of the charges. And uh, so the W ambiguity is not there, but there's another extra condition that one should uh, make sure that uh, is satisfied. 
And this other condition is actually ev uh, what eventually leads to the redefinition of the temperature, as we'll see. So uh, our main result before coming to the details is that the integrability condition for the entropy requires modification in surface gravity equals temperature. It suggests a different temperature uh, and that's basically our main result. Okay, so let me very briefly go through uh, the solution phase space method, uh, which again, Walt had a pivotal role in its development uh, through some papers that he did, uh, wrote in the 1990s. And also some other people like uh, Barnish and Barnish can compare uh, later on. So uh, <clears throat> this is based on the uh, um, concept that uh, basically all solutions to any theory can form a phase space. And one can uh, read the symplectic form on that phase space from the theory and uh, there is a well-defined uh, procedure to define this uh, simplicity form. Uh, and one can actually use this powerful method as, as we did uh, very explicitly in this paper with Kamal, uh, that one can re-derive uh, black hole thermodynamics using uh, this uh, uh, method uh, in a much simpler way than uh, previously argued by Walt and collaborators. Uh, so it's a very powerful method and it bypasses the WMP. That's why we're interested. Okay, so uh, according, uh, it's based on the covariant phase space method, which asserts that uh, all field configurations form a phase space. Uh, and so if we consider field, a generic field configuration by phi and uh, the unshell field configurations by phi bar, uh, and around this, we can uh, consider any perturbation given by delta phi. Uh, typically, I'll uh, assume that this delta phi satisfies Anshul uh, condition, which is basically the linearized equation of motion. And uh, this delta phi could be as uh, one forms uh, over the cotangent space of the phase space, uh, which is uh, basically labeled by this uh, field configurations phi. Uh, this delta phi uh, has two general uh, important directions. Uh, one is uh, the associated with uh, diffeomorphisms on this uh, given solution. And the other is the parametric variation. And actually I'm going to focus on this part, the parametric variations, just to have a, a simple picture of this. For example, cons consider Schwarzschild black hole. It has a parameter M in it. And uh, you can consider another black hole with parameter m plus delta m. Uh, so uh, the difference between these, uh, the difference of these two uh, Schwarzschild solutions is of course satisfying the linearized field equations and moving in uh, this, uh, shifting this parameter m is like moving in this phase space generated by the parametric transformations or parametric variations. Okay. Uh, but how do we con uh, construct the symplectic structure? Uh, let's suppose that we have an unshell uh, closed non-degenerate uh, form. It's a D minus one form over the space time and a two form over the phase space. As you can see, it's a two form over the phase space and it's a D minus one form over the uh, space time. And one can uh, integrate this uh, 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 W uh, over a Cauchy surface, a constant time slice, if you wish, uh, and uh, basically get this two form omega, which is, uh, is a two form over the phase space. And this is, uh, can be used to define the symplectic structure over the phase space. But how do we construct this W? Uh, one can uh, construct this W from uh, the so called pre symplectic potential theta. Uh, by taking a uh, variation of this theta, namely, if we have this theta, uh, do this operation, which is just a simple algebraic operation, and we get this W. But how do we get this theta? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Leewald actually g gave us the simple equation to do so. Starting from, from the Lagrangian, when we want to, for example, derive the equations of motion, we take its variation. 
and on shell it's a total derivative and this defines theta so just take the uh, Lagrangian take the variation compute it on shell you get theta but then if you shift at L by total derivative this shifts theta by uh, a total variation just this is the same W ambiguity that we discussed before uh, since uh, here we are defining d of theta, uh, theta could be uh, shifted by d of something, and it doesn't change this uh, definition. Okay, so this is the uh, y ambiguity, and uh, one can easily see that if we shift theta by this delta of something, um, here uh, w is not shifted because delta squared is uh, zero okay so this w ambiguity does not change uh, uh, this omega but this y ambiguity or y freedom that we have in definition of theta if you define it this way uh, it enters into uh, definition of w that we have so this is actually the uh, basis of how and why the W ambiguity will not enter the charges that are I'm going to define using this method because it shifts theta, but it doesn't shift W or omega, okay? And uh, as I mentioned here, I take this uh, W to be uh, unshell closed and non-degenerate and this basically means that uh, the conservation means uh, this equation, D of that is zero on shell, and uh, it's non-degeneracy leads to the fact that this W is non-degenerate over the phase space, and hence we have a well-defined symplectic form over the phase space or solution space. Uh, but how do we define the charges? Since D of this uh, omega is zero on shell, one can unshell write it as d of something using Poincare lemma, where k is a d minus two form uh, over the space time and a one form over the phase space. Here, note that uh, this w was a two form over this uh, phase space. I take uh, uh, the entries here to be speci specifically chosen uh, transformations. So this one is a generic transformation. This one is uh, a chosen transformation, which generates the symmetry. And defined this way, k is uh, ambiguous up to uh, a d of something, and this is my z uh, ambiguity. So there, in the wald uh, derivation, I discussed three ambiguities. In this other uh, parallel formulation, there are also three ambiguities, as I discussed. But these ambiguities, uh, among these ambiguities, only the y ambiguity uh, enters into the definition of the charges that I'm presenting here in this formulation, whereas the W ambiguity was uh, also entering the other, uh, in the notable uh, derivation was entering into the charge. So uh, the, if I define the charge variation in this way, uh, using this K, uh, basically uh, there is no W ambiguity in the definition of the charge. But actually, this formulation does not give me the charge, but the charge variation. And one uh, to define the charge, one needs to make sure that this, what I have denoted by the delta slash, is actually a closed form over the phase space, and namely it uh, satisfies this condition. This is the integrability condition for the charge, and if it is satisfied, uh, we can define the charge itself. Okay. Uh, the integrability condition for the level formulation is given by this equation, but mm, in principle, one should check this, and I'll uh, come to this briefly uh, soon. And once it is integrable, we can define the charge. So that's basically a very uh, a quick uh, review of this formulation. Uh, for black hole thermodynamics, I'll uh, restrict myself to uh, the killing vectors, the exact symmetries over which the variation of the uh, fields are zero by definition. And I'll uh, restrict myself to the cotangent space, which uh, is parameterized by parametric variations rather than the diffeomorphisms. And 
basically, uh, as we have shown in this paper, one can basically, given the uh, killing vectors of the solution, one can just uh, use this machinery in a very efficient uh, and handy way to ba basically uh, derive uh, the charges and show the mm, <clears throat> black hole uh, thermodynamics. Okay. So th this was uh, uh, as for the uh, charges and, and basically two different methods to define the charges. Uh, let me now uh, go to the second part, which is uh, uh, basically about Horn-Lesky th gravity theories and uh, specific black hole solutions. So uh, uh, Horn-Lesky gravity theories are uh, good class of uh, scalar tensor theories, which have second order uh, field equations. Uh, there's uh, an action which governs this, and uh, these actions have been classified. Uh, and they're in the most general form, uh, they take uh, this, they are described by this Lagrangian. There are uh, uh, Four functions, which are in this uh, Lagrangians, are uh, arbitrary functions of phi, the scalar that we have in the scalar tensor theory, and this uh, x, which is basically uh, d phi square up to a minus half. So, so this is the most general uh, class of horn density theories. For uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with the Lovelock uh, theories, actually, horn desky is a generalization of Lovelock. Uh, uh, basically theory to uh, scalar tensor theory in the sense that these are the most general theories uh, in this scalar tensor uh, family, which have second order field equations. Okay. Uh, so uh, people have been interested in this horn theories recently because of uh, uh, possible cosmological applications. Uh, in the family that I'm going to be uh, interested in discussing, I'm interested in actually this uh, class of theories in principle, where this G can be a generic function of X and Y. But the scalar field can have uh, any uh, action. So the, the scalar is described by this G2 part of the action. Uh, in cosmology, actually, the reason why people have been interested in uh, this theory is, uh, is motivated by dark energy. Being a scalar tensor theory, uh, people have tried to promote this theories as a theory for the dark energy. Uh, it, an important uh, feature of this Hornetsky theories, which have been discussed extensively in the literature, uh, is that the speed of gravitons uh, in these theories is different than speed of light. And this will be actually an important uh, feature for the analysis that I'm going to present. But uh, just if you want to really treat this as a theory for dark energy, as people have uh, discussed, um, it, the uh, gravity wave de detection, uh, this one uh, in 2017, uh, which was basically coming from the two neutron star mergers into a black hole, uh, in, in puts some very strong bounds on the on these theories in the sense that the speed of gravitons uh, cannot be uh, much different than the speed of light, up, and it can deviate only uh, up to less than 10 to minus 15. But uh, the, just as a side remark, this condition comes from the assumption that the dark energy is, is described by these theories. If you relax this condition, this bound does not necessarily apply. Okay. But uh, I'm not interested in the applications of these theories in cosmology. I'm just going to study black holes. Uh, and for me, this is just a laboratory to check whether we understand black hole thermodynamics and the crux of these uh, derivations. So that's basically the main object. So let's uh, basically focus on these theories. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a, a good class of uh, uh, Horn-Desky family. But uh, 
where this G mu nu is the Einstein tensor. And uh, remember this uh, identity, we'll come back to it. So uh, Ricci times two derivative of phi uh, could be written in terms of this combination and a total derivative, okay? And uh, this actually suggests, and uh, one can check you know, for specific examples, that this uh, two form, the, uh, um, which was given uh, in, as the integrand of the Wald entropy, is ambiguous up to the, this is a sort of W ambiguity, very explicit form of a W ambiguity that one can add to this uh, Q that we had in Wald entropy. And uh, where this lambda is just an arbitrary uh, parameter. And this uh, combination for black holes in Horndesky theory remains finite and hence the, ambigu uh, the ambiguity does not cancel out unlike what the uh, general argument by one was. So we, we could be potentially in trouble uh, with the Wald entropy formula. That's what it means. At least for this class of theories where uh, this part of the, uh, I mean, there, there exists a, a non-vanishing uh, finite W ambiguity. But again, one can use this other solution phase space method to bypass this problem. But uh, solution phase space method uh, gives me the charge variation. So I just apply this to the killing vector, which generates the horizon, zeta h. It gives me the uh, some charge variation. If this charge variation is of this form with this uh, uh, mm, carefully chosen coefficient, t black hole, then the rest would be uh, delta s and it becomes integrable, meaning that uh, this de delta uh, slash h is not uh, uh, d of something, but if you take out this uh, prefactor, it becomes d of the delta of something and becomes integral. So the qu question is uh, basically what is this t black hole? Uh, and this equation actually tells us how to do it. Once you have this, you divide it by uh, the proper factor, which makes this charge integral. So the integrability actually fixes what I'll call the black hole temperature, okay? But uh, this black hole temperature should be something purely geometric, which is computed uh, over the uh, H and should be a constant to qualify as uh, black hole temperature, okay? So, uh, let me go through the, uh, the, the issue of speed of gravitons, which would be actually important in my uh, analysis. So uh, these are some general comments, which we can discuss later, they're not crucial. So in view of time, I'll just skip this. In order to read uh, the uh, speed of gravitons, there are uh, various different ways. Uh, basically the standard way, is that given a solution, black hole, cosmological background or whatever, you can basically try to linearize theory around this solution. And uh, then you have um, some wave equations for each and every perturbative mode, uh, scalars, uh, graviton, photons, and what, uh, other fields that you have in the game. And you can, uh, from this uh, wave equation, you can read the speed of uh, that wave from the dispersion relation. Uh, and that's the standard method. But uh, uh, here I'll just present a shortcut. So uh, let's suppose that we have the field configuration G and phi. I can de decompose metric in this way, um, where this phi mu is the uh, unit vector along the gradient of phi. And this sigma is basically appropriately chosen by the norm of this phi mu, uh, phi uh, gradient of phi. And we choose the, uh, this such uh, by definition, uh, basically with this choice of sigma, uh, H is normal to uh, this gradient of phi. Now I do this, uh, what I call uh, phi plus three decomposition of the Lagrangian. If phi is uh, along the time direction, this is the standard uh, three plus one decomposition, but in the black hole solutions that I'm interested in, 
phi is normal in the radial direction and phi plus three is not standard three plus one. Uh, this uh, analysis has been done in this paper. I just showed the result where K is the extrinsic curvature of uh, constant phi surfaces. Uh, from these uh, two terms, actually, uh, I can readily uh, read the speed of graviton. So the coefficient, uh, the uh, ratio of the coefficients of these two terms, if you did the linearized uh, analysis that I just mentioned, linearized perturbation analysis, the ratio of these two terms appears to be the uh, speed of uh, waves. But depending on whether uh, this uh, phi is time-like or space-like, uh, there are two different ratios which appear as the uh, speed of graviton. And here is basically uh, the uh, final result. If graviton is moving normal to phi mu for a black hole case, where phi mu is uh, space-like, uh, speed of gravitons is one. But if you have, uh, for example, if phi is in the radial direction and the gravitons are moving in the radial direction, for, for example, falling into the hole or coming out, the speed of gravitons uh, would be given by this equation. For cosmological backgrounds, if uh, we have, for example, a FRW background which is uh, isotropic, the speed of gravitons is just the inverse of this for all gravitons moving uh, different directions. Okay. But uh, realizing that the gravitons are moving with different speed than speed of light, one can ask uh, whether uh, there is a metric, an effective metric, where gravitons are moving on its null rays. So if I denote this metric by this G, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, basically ask what's, whether there exists this effective metric, uh, G, which satisfies this equation for uh, K mu being mm -hmm. the uh, momentum vector for the gravitons. And just uh, from the previous analysis, it's actually very easy to read what this G should be. Uh, so, so this is basically this, uh, uh, the effective metric for gravitons is given by this equation. And for those of you who are familiar with this sort of uh, type of analysis, and I'm sure in the audience there are many, uh, this is basically a disformal transformation. So it's uh, basically proportional to the metric, the original metric with this uh, component factor, but then there are parts which are uh, pro proportional to the derivative of phi. So uh, basically, uh, upon this, com this formal map, uh, we can find the effective metric for the gravitons. Just to show you uh, uh, basically the light cones, uh, if we have the light cones for the original metric G mu nu, the light cone for the uh, effective uh, graviton metric is now of this form. And actually for the examples that I'm going to sh focus on, the speed of graviton is less than one. So the light cone is basically uh, inside this. Uh, this actually uh, requirement is necessary if we want to have a well-posed uh, dynamics. Uh, for the horn desky theory. This has been uh, recently studied in this, uh, in this paper. And I guess uh, I, there was a seminar by this guy in CISA some time ago, uh, some few months ago on the same uh, topic. And then there's a, a recent paper by Harvey Rall, which uh, extends uh, this analysis. Okay, so, uh, now, uh, basically, the proposal we make is that uh, given this, the fact that there are two metrics, one effectively for the gravitons, the other for the, or, uh, for the other uh, fields, for example, photons, uh, one can ask whether the surface gravity should be, uh, that we use in the uh, black hole temperature should be which of these, uh, come, should be the surface gravity of which of these metrics. Our proposal is that uh, what matters for the uh, black hole uh, thermodynamics is the one associated with the gravitons and the effective metric for the gravitons. So uh, just going to a simple uh, uh, straightforward algebra, one can find uh, D of this zeta h. 
which uh, at the horizon takes this form. This is just uh, using this disformal map. One can readily check this. Where this epsilon is now the uh, biformal, uh, binormal tensor to the bifurcation surface uh, using this uh, effective metric for gravitons. So, uh, But uh, in order to basically read the black hole temperature, we need to replace this epsilon with the other epsilon uh, that we had in the original metric. Because uh, remember that uh, we are going to integrate over h. And in that h, we need to, uh, I mean, the bifurcation surface. And in that, we need to uh, basically uh, use the original metric. And this is the coefficient that we need to put. These two binormal vectors are related in this way. And just plugging back into the equations, we get this. And hence, the, we find an effective uh, uh, gra surface gravity for gravitons, uh, which is given by this uh, formula. Uh, this G is def uh, defining my theory, if you remember from the Horn-Desk reaction. And hence, we propose that uh, the uh, temperature for gravitons is given by the surface gravity for the gravitons and <clears throat> is given by this equation. So as you see, the, there is a non-trivial factor which enters into the game. And hence the surface gravity, the standard equation, kappa over two pi is not giving me the uh, temperature for gravitons. Okay, so now the proposal is that if you use this temperature for gravitons, uh, the first law of thermodynamics just works perfectly and the entropy becomes integrable. Let me show this to some different examples. So let's consider, for example, a horn desk in Maxwell theory in four dimensions. Uh, in basically, uh, it's a specific uh, theory with G4 equals one and G5 to equal two gamma phi. So it's a specific family uh, uh, theory in that family of horn desk uh, theories. It, has, it admits uh, an, a charge black hole solution, an extension of uh, riser nordstrom black hole, which is given by this uh, metric and this uh, scalar and the vector. If you note know the derivative of phi, uh, because of this factor f, which is the GRR of the metric, blows up at the horizon, because f vanishes at the horizon, and hence it blows up. But the point is uh, the scalar invariance made out of this phi, in particular this x, which was d phi squared, uh, remains finite. So uh, this is why and how the uh, smoothness argument of Walt fails. The solution is perfectly smooth uh, on the horizon if you use the uh, appropriate coordinate system. But on the other hand, it allows you to have a non, it opens the way to have a non-zero finite doggy ambiguity. Okay, so as you can see, this thing, phi squared remains finite. And uh, one can just go through the equations uh, and uh, compute the mass and uh, electric charge as conserved charges associated with the killing vector d by dt, and this is the electric charge associated with the global part of the U1 symmetry of the Maxwell theory. And just the standard equations uh, leads, uh, if we use the Wald entropy, basically uh, we get this uh, uh, equation where R, Rh is the radius of uh, horizon, but if we didn't redefine the temperature as we propose, one can show that the first law of thermodynamics does not hold. However, if you replace this H0 with the T black hole or temperature of uh, gravitons, the, this equation holds and it's perfectly fine. The first law is safe if we use our uh, proposed uh, temperature. And actually this, the same uh, temperature makes this S integrable. So I just spare you with the details of the computation. It's a straightforward, but a bit lengthy. So uh, the, using this temperature, the entropy becomes integrable and the first slice. So that's the conclusion. 
uh, okay. And in particular, I would like you to note that the black hole temperature, the temperature for gravitons is less than uh, this T0, the kappa over two, and the speed of gravitons exclusively for this uh, solution, one can check that it's less than one. So the light ones actually do have uh, the form that I just showed. Uh, just as another example, let me show you this uh, in three dimensions. Uh, this ADS von Nessy theory, we have uh, BTZ black, uh, black holes. Uh, one can construct rotating BTZ black holes, which are uh, stationary, but not static. Uh, the solution is given uh, here in this equation. And again, as you can see, uh, uh, this derivative of phi is blowing up because of the appearance of this H. Uh, blows up at the horizon. But again, uh, the derivative of phi squared, uh, this x remains finite because it has just one uh, over root h in phi. One can go through, again, uh, simple uh, algebra uh, to find that our proposed temperature for black hole is not kappa over 2, but is, uh, it has this extra numeric factor in front. And uh, one can show that with this uh, black hole temperature, uh, the first law is fine. There we, and basically, it's a sort of check of our proposed temperature. Uh, you can find more uh, examples in our paper. So let me summarize and uh, make some concluding remarks. Uh, the wall entropy formula uh, written here uses the fact that this kappa is uh, basically the black hole uh, temperature, as I have just tried to make it very explicit and insert it here. And uh, in it works if the ambiguities, uh, the, in particular, the W ambiguity is not there, as Walt has argued. And uh, there are cases where uh, the Walt's argument fails. And the Horndesky family is one of them. There are other examples and families. Uh, we use solution phase space method, which is uh, not uh, and it is not suffered suffering from this W ambiguity, but it gives us uh, entropy variation and uh, an appropriate choice for the black hole temperature uh, makes this entropy variation integrable and one can define the entropy. And using that uh, appropriate normalization, which makes the uh, black hole uh, ent the entropy integrable, actually gives me the appropriate temperature, which also satisfies the first law. So that's uh, what we show uh, and argue for. And uh, once again, this is basically our main result, that the black hole temperature, sorry, this should be kappa over two, sorry, this is, um, it should be just the other way around, is, uh, scaled by this factor, which depends on the theory. Okay. We try to argue that this should be related to the fact that the black hole, uh, the speed of gravitons and the structure of the light cone is different for the Horn-Desky than, for example, the other theories of gravity, which respect a strong uh, statement of the equivalence principle. And uh, then we showed and argued that uh, gravitons are moving on the null rays of this uh, metric G, which is related to the original metric by this, this formal transformation. And uh, basically, that's uh, what I just mentioned. Uh, again, let me emphasize that uh, uh, our uh, 
arguments are general and are not limited to the horn desky. We just focus on the horn desky because uh, we had examples uh, that one could check the proposal. And uh, it, it is very interesting to examine our analysis and arguments for other theories of gravity. Actually, the, uh, in, on the other side of the story, I mean, um, uh, we, our analysis is shedding light on uh, black hole thermodynamics in general. So as I argued, the laws of black hole thermodynamics have been uh, derived, uh, as Walt famously did, uh, for any uh, general covariant theory of gravity. And uh, it puts some em the emphasis on general covariance. And actually, the fa family of theories that uh, Walt uses, although he does not emphasize, uses local Lorentzian mm, uh, invariant actions. Uh, and one can uh, basically check and ask, uh, what are the, the other uh, basic features of gravity theories which could be coming into the derivation of uh, black hole thermodynamics and into the black hole, uh, in the uh, thermodynamic picture for the black holes? Whether, for example, the, what we need is general covariance or something less than general covariance, I mean, uh, something less than equivalence principle, whether we, we need background independence or not. So this is uh, actually uh, what we try to argue is that uh, for the uh, Horndesky family, although the strong version of the equivalence principle uh, is not holding just by construction, uh, we still have this black hole picture, uh, thermodynamic picture, but with the appropriately defined uh, temperature. So uh, let me also uh, briefly mention some argument about the second law of black hole thermodynamics. Uh, I just showed you more equations which are uh, checking the first law, but uh, one should make sure that uh, the second law is also holding. And uh, here is an example where one can check the first, uh, the second law. For example, let's suppose that we have a black hole and then you are sending in a shell of, for example, photons at a, with a given energy and at a given te temperature, T of photons. And uh, so it, this shell of photons carries some entropy and one wants to check whether uh, the system before uh, this photons falling into the hole, and uh, after uh, the en the entropy does not decrease uh, in this process, and one can actually show that uh, once the uh, black hole after uh, the fall falling in of the photons in, uh, to the black hole settles in into the black hole temperature that we propose, actually the se uh, the second law uh, holds if we use our temperature. So. Uh, it's not a proof, let me emphasize, but it's basically uh, checking for different examples that we have uh, done. We, uh, we have analyzed that the second law is respected if we use the temperature we are uh, introducing. It's of course uh, desirable to have a proof for the second law uh, using our temperature. Uh, and it, it, it is important what the temperature of the black hole is for uh, having the second law. Okay, uh, our analysis actually also has suggestions and mm, for other aspects of black hole thermodynamics. For those of you who are from familiar with species problem, basically uh, the question is if you have several different uh, uh, massless states in your game, uh, are they, for example, gravitons, photons, scalars, uh, and uh, the other things? Uh, whether the uh, uh, and if you suppose that the uh, black hole entropy is given um, or the black hole microstates is given by a uh, ensemble a thermal ensemble of these massless states which appear also in the Hawking radiation uh, what's the basically which species contributes to the horizon uh, sorry to the entropy 
And our proposal suggests that since the, what matters is the temperature associated with the gravitons, gravitons should be the ones uh, which uh, basically constitute the entropy uh, of the black hole. And it suggests that the species problem uh, is uh, not there because the, what matters is the gravitons and not the other mass states, even if you have them in the field. Uh, one needs to actually uh, check our proposal further by uh, doing a different type of analysis that people have uh, studied in the literature. For example, uh, one may study the Hawking radiation, uh, go through the Arnold's derivation for the black hole temperature, or mm, you try to uh, study this Euclidean angel action method by uh, Gibbons Hawking and uh, basically compute the free energy and hence check whether our uh, temperature appears in the right way as it should in this Euclidean Anshul action analysis. And also for the other theories of uh, gravity, including Einstein ether theory. Um, so let me just leave you with the slide and finish here. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, now it's time for questions. If anybody has a question, please ask it. Okay, I, I have one myself. Please. So, yeah, you've been showing that actually you get a different result and you've been arguing that this is because of the different, um, let's say, local dynamics of the gravitons due to the different speed of, uh, of light. Mm -hmm. that they inherit in this theory. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because uh, in principle, if I think on computing this entropy through a different method, for example, using entanglement entropy for uh, using the replica trick, mm -hmm. uh, in there, the dynamics of the gravitons is controlled in this same theory also by the Einstein-Hilbert term. So I don't know how you could get a different uh, result here, or I don't know if you have any intuition of what happens or... Uh, sorry. Uh, so in you, you're thinking about, for example, uh, some black hole uh, solutions in a uh, Horn-Lesky theory, and you want to compute uh, using, for example, the uh, RT holographic uh, yeah. entanglement entropy equation for computing the entanglement entropy for this black hole. Is it the setup that you have in mind? Well, it's no, I'm just thinking because there is this um, connection between the uh, Hawking's, uh, well, um, Bekenstein entropy and the uh, entanglement entropy that if you take uh -huh. a set of degrees of freedom and mm -hmm. compute entanglement entropy between different regions uh -huh. using the something, well, maybe it's too technical, but using something which is called the replica trick, mm -hmm. you reproduce the first term that you reproduce is precisely the area law. You reproduce the uh, Hawking radiation and then you have subleading terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, may, maybe, maybe it's too, too far from what you have discussed here, but the uh, in there, this computation is completely controlled by the dynamics of the gravitons. And the dynamics of the gravitons, uh, in the, I mean, if you forget about the scalar field, it's, it's dominated by the Einstein-Hilbert term. So I don't see how the local behavior of the gravitons can uh, lead to a different result. That's... Uh, so here you're, you made some implicit assumption, which uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's true. So. Uh, first of all, uh, one needs to check the RT formula uh, that, or the replica trick, it, uh, which is basically the holographic dual of that, uh, right? Uh, that it works with exactly the same, uh, exactly the same coefficients that people have uh, uh, suggested for these theories as well. I'm not sure if that, that has been done. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it has been done. It was just okay. a, a so it was a. Yes, and I'm not sure if that's true. Okay. Okay. Second thing is that uh, in using the RD formula, as you know, uh, the uh, therefore at least for this uh, uh, stationary cases, the so-called minimal surface there, or a static case, just let's make it simpler. Uh, the minimal surface there could be uh, need not be. Uh, uh, it can have disjoint parts, right? Mm -hmm. For example, the uh, just by definition, any killing horizon is a minimal surface, right? Hmm? Yes. And then uh, you, basically, 
essentially, if you want to compute, this is why and how it produces the black hole entropy, because the horizon is a minimal surface, and just uh, it should re reduce, the, if you use the RT formula or its extension for modified gravity theories, there, there are some various different extensions of that, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, for modified theories of gravity, th these are uh, some different functionals have been proposed to give you the entropy, uh, the entanglement entropy. But uh, 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 one of them just directly re reduces to Wall's entropy if you compute it for the minimal surface, which is the horizon. Okay. But again, in uh, so th the question uh, goes back to whether uh, that. Mm, uh, functional, the entropy functional uh, that you're using uh, should uh, have a different normalization. So let me just uh, just l l l let's look at this. This could be one of those entropy functionals. Actually, there are other one. Uh, there are others, but for uh, mm, mm, this is one of them at least for the uh, bifurcation surfaces. You can view this as a wall entropy for the black hole or the entropy function for the entanglement entropy. They are just the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a normalization factor that one should uh, check. And uh, actually what we are saying and what we are proposing is that the entropy function should be modified in the way that we are saying by norm proper normalization factor. Okay. So, but it, uh, as far as I know, this has not been an analyzed. Uh, and it's actually, I think, a very good uh, and handy question to address. Uh, all the ingredients are there. Uh, and our proposal is that the entropy function should be modified by normalization. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So is there any other question? Yes, hello, please. I have a question. Please. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, brilliant presentation. It was very impressive for me. Thank you so much. Uh, please, do we get more in touch uh, the real black holes when we we take into account this uh, kind of gravity model? Mm -hmm. uh, well. Uh, mm our primary motivation for considering this Hornetsky gravity theory was, uh, for example, this one or the others that I just showed, was uh, uh, to check whether we understand the crux and uh, of how uh, theoretical aspects of black holes, in particular black hole thermodynamics works. So uh, basically our question was, uh, uh, whether black hole thermodynamics is based on only general covariance or other features of uh, or equivalence principle or background independence or uh, all these other features which some gravity theory, Einstein gravity or uh, otherwise may or may not have. So the, our motivation was purely theoretical, trying to understand uh, the fundamentals of uh, black hole thermodynamics. But uh, on the other hand, as I just uh, argued, uh, in cosmology literature, in recent literature, uh, motivated by dark energy models, people have also been considering Horndensky theories. But after uh, this observation that I just mentioned, um, uh, where uh, speed of gravitons were restricted so much this family of uh, theories, Hornetsky theories that I'm interested in was disfavored by, for the cosmological reasons. There are other members of this Hornetsky families that I did not discuss here and uh, which is still considered in the context of cosmology. So I hope I could answer the question. Okay, so uh, the, all of these uh, family of, families of Hornetsky theories uh, do they depend on what we, we take into account when we start uh, writing the entropy, uh, the, the action, please? So are there many families of uh, all the key theory depending on what we take into account when we start, when we start with? 
So uh, the Hornetsky family, as I mentioned, is a, a scalar tensor uh, family. So we have a metric and a scalar as the degrees of freedom. And uh, it has, uh, it's defined with the property that the equations of motion for these two fields should be second order. So with this requirement, actually one can show as Horndesky has shown in his paper of uh, 1970s, uh, that the most general form of the action for uh, with this requirement is given here. This is the most general form of the uh, theory. Okay, we are um, we are a bit late uh, already, so I think it's uh, the moment to stop here. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming, and just remember that next week we have another seminar. Uh,